Well, we're in our, our fourth and final week in this uh, series, Conversations with God, Prayer's Place in Everyday Life. And how many of you are glad that we have a God that listens to us when we pray, right? He doesn't just say, hey, you can figure this out, Ben. Uh, and week one, we learned that he's never too busy for us to ask him for anything. Uh, we can approach him. He's eager and ready to listen to his children, and he cares about every detail of your life. How amazing is that? Right, And then the second week we discovered that he gets you. You don't need to change the words. You don't need to change the way you talk to fit in. It's like flashback to middle school. You remember when you had to talk differently just to be cool? You know, I guess I'm the only, I'm the only one. You know? But uh, uh, you, know, you don't have to do it. You don't have to know fancy words. Like God doesn't respond to people who have degrees in theology any better than someone who has no degree or didn't even graduate from kindergarten, all right? He doesn't care what language you use. He judges the heart, and, and, and he can simply get you. And then last week we talked about what it feels like when what to do when your prayers are hitting the ceiling. And we've all been there. We feel like giving up. We just want to quit because it's not really getting through. We feel like he's not listening. And we all have these moments, don't we? And what we discover from the Word of God is that when you have these crises, these faith crises, that you can't give up. you got to keep moving forward. Which leads us into today's big idea, which is... Oh, it's not on there. All right, man, this is a really hard, uh, hard day for me. The big idea is this. Prayer helps me discover God's will. Prayer helps me discover God's will. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, when I use the word will, it means the ability to make decisions or restraining yourself from doing something or restraining yourself for doing something for someone else. Right? And so, like, if I'm on a diet, part of having amazing willpower is saying no to the donuts, Right? You know, I, I'm going to lose weight in 2020. You're not if you're going to keep feeding your face with pizza and donuts, Ben. So my will is to not do that. I'm going to control myself. Or if you're a parent, you know sometimes will is not doing what you want to do in order to help your kids, right? Learn and grow and become responsible and mature adults. Am I the only one in the place that the Lord is showing this, this definition of will to, Right? Sometimes I can't do what I want to do because I need to do what's better. And for God, he has a will, and it's simply his plan for his creation, his plan for your life. God has a will for your life. That's exciting. What does this mean? It means you can't twist God's arm either. You can't make him do anything. He has a will. His will will be done, right? You, you can't peer pressure God into anything. I remember when I was a kid, I used to be like, well, God, if you just do this, then I'll do that. Like, God isn't into the negotiation business, right? He, 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 he has a will, and, and the fact that he has a plan for our life is awesome. How many of you saw this sunset on Friday night? Friday night, I was on a uh, Ferris wheel with my kids. No, I was on the zipper. That was a little bit crazier, a little later in the evening. Uh, it's one of those ones that goes, choo, 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 and you're afraid that the bolts are going to fall out of the, you know? So first of all, it took faith just to get on there. And then I look out and I see this, and it's so red and gorgeous. And I was like, wow. And I'm on top of this amusement park, and I'm like, wow, I, God, you are so amazing. I was on another ride with Caden, and I told him it was a kiddie ride. It was a lie. I'm sorry. It wasn't a kiddie ride. And we get on. It looked like a kiddie ride. It was these little airplanes. And we get on, and, and he, Caden gets locked in his seat. And then he goes, does this ride go upside down? And the guy goes, yes. And he gave me the look. <laughs> And we started going upside down, and, and it was awesome. About 30 seconds into the ride, as we flipped up 37 times upside down, Caden goes, Jesus, I trust you. <laughs> but you see this sunset, this beautiful thing in creation, and you're like, look at the God. He created this whole thing, and he has a plan for my life. And sometimes I, I doubt whether or not God really knows what's best because his way looks a little different than my way, you know? I figure like I have it all figured out and then I see things like this and, and I'm just amazed. I mean, the galaxy, 100,000 light years from one end to the other, right? Over 200 billion stars in the sky. And in the center, there's a black hole. 
They can't even take pictures of the galaxy because it's so awesome and amazing and great. But this is their theory. This is the pieces that they've puzzled together, right? It's so amazing to me how scientists can believe in faith, things that they discover themselves, but they have a hard time sometimes believing in a God that they just because they can't see him. Amen. Even though everything in creation points to an awesome God, a God of creation, a, a God that has a plan for every single one of us. Amen. He's awesome, isn't he? Yeah. This design is amazing. It takes our breath away. And just like he had a design or a plan for his, his, his galaxy, uh, the, the galaxies, the, on the day of creation, he has a plan for your life. And thinking about how omniscient and omnipotent God is got me really thinking about how sometimes I'm so totally wrong. <laughs> like really, really, really wrong. Which leads me to this question today. Have you ever asked a question you were sure you knew the answer to, but turns out you were wrong? Right? Sometimes my wife and I will get to talking and I'll ask her a question specifically because we both know the answer to it until she tells me I'm wrong and to which I proceed, no, I'm not. You're wrong. <laughs> right? Are we the only couple in here that sometimes, you know, no, 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 I'm right. And we go back and forth for a few times and I'm like, just Google it. <laughs> Guys, listen to me. That's the famous last words of any man, right? Just Google it until you find out you're really wrong. Don't Google it. Just stick with the, you're right, right? <laughs> and how about with God? Are, are you ever wrong when it comes to God? Is it possible that some of us could be wrong in, in our view of God and his plan for our life? Is it possible that we might be thinking and dreaming of things in the flesh, in ourselves, that God hasn't actually purposed for us, right? You can't Google that. And that's the problem. It'd be so much easier if you could just be like, what's the plan and purpose for my life? Hit enter, you know? You do that, Siri's going to say, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. Because it's different for each of us because God has a different plan and purpose for every single person's life. <laughs> this happened to Jesus. Like this thing that we're talking about today happened to Jesus. He and his friends were in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22, verses 41 to 47, and this is what takes place. He tells them, hey, you guys wait over here, and I'm going to go over here. This is the night before he's betrayed, and it says, he walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. See, Jesus is fully man and fully God. Jesus knows what's about to go down. He told his friends what was going to happen to him. He knows full well. And that verse that we're looking at, Hebrews 12, verse 2, says he endured the suffering, the shame of the cross. Like this was the worst thing anybody has ever endured. Have you ever been punished for something you didn't deserve? Like that's bad enough, right? But he was actually beaten to death over something that he didn't deserve. He says, God, if you can take this away, if you can take the whipping away, if you can take the ridicule away, if you can take away them stripping off my clothes and making me parade around, if you can take away the shame, and if you can take away the embarrassment, God, please do it. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently. And he was in so much agony of spirit that, he, that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. See, God's will isn't always what we want it to look like. Jesus is praying. He doesn't really have any kind of an agenda. He has a want. He says, Father, would you please take this, if it's possible to do it any other way, 
Please do it. Many of us have read and studied about the agony that Jesus had to go through. Right? But listen, sometimes, sometimes God's plan requires suffering. This isn't going to sell a lot of books. It's not going to make me a lot of friends. But as I read the scriptures, there's plenty of times where people said, God, if you would just do this, John the Baptist is in prison. Hey, go see if this has really happened, if Jesus is really the dude, if he's really the man that he said he was going to be. And Jesus says, oh, hey, yeah, go tell John that, that the lame walk, the dumb see, the deaf hear. But sorry, John, it's your time to suffer. That's the message he's sending back. If it's, you know, we say, God, take this away from me. But what if it's his plan that you go through it? I mean, if it's really the best way, Jesus says, if this is really the best way, then I'll do it. I don't want to, Father, but I will. See, Jesus is wrestling with his faith. Jesus is wrestling with God and the truth that sometimes his plan doesn't look like our plan. Right? His ways aren't always the easiest. His ways aren't always pain-free. His ways aren't always emotionally easy. But they are best. And sometimes you can only stand His will through prayer. And when you pray, it helps you discover His will for your life. It may not be instantaneous. It may not be crystal clear. But as you wrestle with God in prayer, as you trust Him, and as you say, not my plans, God, but your plans be done, then he'll give you greater insights to why and how and even when. But he has a plan for your life. Sometimes we don't hear him, though, do we? We get so focused on our ways that we forget God has a different way. Is it possible that he's already answered the prayer, but we don't see the answer because we're so set on it being done the way we want it to be done? Right? We don't take the time to stop, to listen, and to look, and to see what he's doing. Or maybe we don't want to accept the reality that's set before us. You know? My wife and I were having a discussion in the car last night, and usually I'm pretty much the po a positive one, and I'm always looking on the bright side. And I was saying something to her, and she goes, Okay, Mr. Negative. <laughs> to which I said, I'm not being negative. I'm being real. Like I'm taking the actual situation for what is going on and this is the truth. And then funny thing, it changed a, a couple hours later. Right? right? Or yeah, actually not even a couple hours, like 15, 20 minutes later it changed. Not a major thing, but something little. Is it possible that our eyes are so focused on what we want that we don't see what he wants? Right? And I believe this is one of the reasons why some of us have ineffective prayer lives. Because we never listen. We never look. We just are so busy talking, talking, talking. Which isn't really bad, but if you don't take time to listen and look for God's activity in your life, you may miss it. Or you may jump from one chaotic thing to another. From one problem to the next. And you never stop and celebrate the victories that he has brought into your life. And, there, the, you know, we say things like, there's no possible way that he could do it differently than this. We put God in a box, don't we? We're like, this is the way the solution looks, and God, you can't really do it. And we probably wouldn't say that in prayer, but we think it all the time. Like, this is the problem. God, just do this. Because this is the solution. And I think a lot of times he's up there and he's like, like in the book of Job, where he's like, did, did you tell the ocean where to start and where to stop? Did you form the mountains? You know, did you put the stars in the sky? Did you hang the moon? We don't always know best. But God does. Psalm 34, verse 4 says, I prayed to the Lord and he heard my answers. I prayed to the Lord and he answers me. Not he heard my answers. He freed me from all my fears. Listen to me, you have a choice of whether you're going to walk in fear or in freedom. I'm going to say that again because that's from God's word and that's really good. 
You have a choice in whether you're going to walk, walk around in fear or in freedom. I've prayed to the Lord and He answered me. He has answered you whether you know it or not. He answers every one of His children's prayers. So you can either choose to trust Him and walk in freedom over anxiety and worry or you can choose to continue to live in the stress and anxiety and fear that life is going to throw at you no matter what. It's going to be there. But what does worrying, Jesus said, what does worrying add to anything? Nothing. It's literally going to eat you alive. So what's, what's the key to a worry-free life? It, it sounds so cliche and so, you know, cookie cutter, but it truly is to trust God no matter what. And how do we learn to, to trust God more? We, we learn through learning His Word. Right? How do we get a clear understanding of who God is and what He wants to do in our life? How do we get an idea of His plan and purpose for our life? By reading this book. Okay? This book is the Word of God. Amen. It's useful for, for teaching and training and rebuking me when I'm wrong. And through this book, God is always speaking. He's always speaking. You don't need to ask yourself, is that real? Did God really say that? If it's in his book, it's real. Amen. See, because here's the thing. In, in the, the Bible, as I read it, God is speaking through the entire thing. I thought, well, what verse should I put up there for you know, God speaking through his word? The whole book. Amen. How about this? Trusting God, the whole thing. I thought, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an awesome sermon on Daniel and the lion's den. And then I'm like, wait, it's every single stinking story in the book. They trusted God and he showed up. What about you? Things don't look the way that you want them to. Well, are you going to trust God? Because his word tells us that he's working it all out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 12 and 4 through 14 says, For if you, live, uh, if you live by its dictates, the flesh, you will die. Your sinful nature, right? Intuitively, we know this is true. We all want to do bad things. Maybe in different areas, but we all have certain bad things that we enjoy, that we're kind of drawn to. It's the lure, uh, the temptation of Satan, right? But if through the power of the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You're a child of God. We learn the Word. We live according to the Word. When you do that, listen, you don't earn your salvation, salvation through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, but children of God do what the Word says. They, they are led by the Spirit. We believe this book was written, how? By the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told the authors what to write. Isn't it amazing that a book that's, you know, 4,000 years old, some of them, 2,000 years old in the New Testament, isn't it amazing how it still speaks today? It's because it's living and active. It's, it's the, the thing that never changes. It's God's Word. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. His Word never changes. And, and we no longer do whatever we want. We operate by God's design, by His boundaries, because He's our Father. You know, it didn't take me much to follow my Father's rules when I was a kid. I was actually, I, I know I've told you stories and it might be hard to believe, but I was actually kind of a, a rule follower when it came to my dad. You know, six foot five, 360, 380, 400 pounds, whatever. And during that time of life that we were in, police chief, you know, I heard stories of this dude picking people up with one arm. He just had to look at me. One time we went to the principal's office. I got in trouble. I was in the principal's office. He came in and asked the principal to leave. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> the chief of police, you know, <laughs> proceeded to spank me in the principal's office. <laughs> Don't make God do that to you. Listen, I knew that, that my dad loved me and I love my dad. And him disciplining me never made me question whether he loved me or not. In fact, the Bible says that God disciplines those he loves. 
He's disciplining us for our benefit, for our betterment. <laughs> so don't think that discipline will be absent from our relationship with God either, right? And this, this is kind of review, but God always answers His children's prayers. He's always there for us. Psalm 5, verse 3, Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Are you waiting expectantly for the Lord to answer? Right? I mean, when I expect someone to show up, I, I'm like, I'm waiting, waiting. If I know somebody's coming to pick me up or somebody's coming to the house, I'm one of those, those guys that walks over and looks out the blind for 15 minutes. You know? Like, I'm expecting you to show up. And when you do, I'm not making you wait. I'm, we're going, you know? And uh, is that your relationship with God? Are you expecting him to answer your prayers? Are you, are, is there an expectancy that your father loves you and cares about you? Or are you more like, well, God, if you could just do this, that'd be great. Lord, if it's not too much to ask, would you, you know, consider? He already has a plan. Right? He already has a plan. Be expectant. 1 John 5, 15 says that, uh, and since we know that he hears us, we may, when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. So are you expecting God to show up? Are you confident that he hears you? Are you confident that he's going to answer you? He wants us to be expectant and confident. Jeremiah 29, verse 12 and 13 after the, the verse that says, I have a plan and a purpose for you, he says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. Listen, he is listening to you. <coughs> if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. It's a promise. It's from God's word. Anybody who seeks him will find him. Amen. And, and, and anytime you consider the whole prayer thing, you know, and you got to know that God always has the right answer, right? I mean, usually Google knows more than me. How about you, right? You, you need to know an answer, search engine, right? You look it up and check it out. Sometimes you buy it, sometimes you don't. But God always has the right answer. God always has the correct answer. He knows more than Google. God is right when Google is wrong. Because God is full of wisdom. He's full of wisdom. And wisdom is critical to understand God's will for your life. You know that? Wisdom is critical. In James 1 verse 5 it says, Hey, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he gives it generously to anyone who asks him. If you're lacking wisdom in life, all you have to do is ask him. In Psalm 147 verse 5, it says, uh, it says, How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. Here's the thing, guys. When you think about things like, why don't the scientists just believe? Why doesn't this person just believe? I think God is so great and so awesome. That's the problem. Sometimes it's hard to believe. Like, wait, God is so much further beyond us that he can just speak and this galaxy comes into existence? Yes. God has the answer to everything? Yes. Wait, isn't there something I know better than God? No. It's beyond comprehension. That's the problem. God's power is so far beyond comprehension. There's times where we're sitting there and we're like, is this real? Yes. Is he real? Yes. He's so powerful and so mighty. Sometimes we just don't get him. Or it causes us to doubt, right? It's beyond. He's beyond comprehension. If there's anything I learned with all those smart people in, in my, you know, in my master programs or in my doctorate, it's a, that there are some smart people, but they don't compare at all to God. God knows everything. He's full of wisdom. So here's my definition for wisdom. It's, it's knowing through life experiences the how, what, and whys of life. And if you think Life is tough if you're going through some difficulties and 
need to know how, how can God still be in control of all this, then spend some time in His Word this week. Spend some time reading the book of Job. Right? The, the man that had everything and lost everything and then questioned God. So God is full of wisdom and He gives it to anybody who asks. It's beyond even understanding. And the other thing that, that, that kind of blows our mind is how powerful He is. See, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He can do all things. Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5, it says this, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise His holy name. Let all that I praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has do that He does for me. Has God done anything good for you? He forgives all my sins. That's enough right there. Right? Anything God does beyond that's like a bonus. Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, you sit down and you order uh, french fries and they bring out a steak. <laughs> Anything God does beyond just forgiving us of our... In fact, just forgiving us of our sins is so much better than we deserve. We don't deserve any of it. And heals all my diseases. Wait, God heals? Yes, God heals. He redeems me from, the de from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Wow, that's awesome. God is omnipotent. He can do all things. Whatever you're facing, He is the answer to whatever you're going through. And another highlight to remember is that God's ways are better. God's ways are better. You probably have a plan for your life, and that's awesome. You probably have your own will for your life, and, and, and that's great. I mean, I, I believe in planning, but listen to me. I trust God's plan over my plan any day of the week, right? Because he knows he, he's, he's stronger than me. He's smarter than me. He's got more wisdom than me. He's probably got better hair than me. I'm just saying. He's just better in every area. His wisdom and His power is beyond comprehension. I trust His plan more than my own. And Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 9 say, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This gets people in trouble because people hear this verse and they're like... Wait a second. Not me. I'm the bomb.com. I know what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying, right? You meet people. Listen, I'm never wrong. Until you are. You're never wrong. Until you are. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but when my wife and I have that disagreement, I am right. And sometimes even after Google tells us differently, I still feel like I was cheated somehow. <laughs> oh, well, that's somebody's blog page. That's not actual research. <laughs> but sometimes as people, we have a hard time admitting when we're wrong or when we need help or when we're just a little bit less than what needs to be. But God's ways are so much higher than our ways. His thoughts are better than our thoughts. And even when stuff hits the fan, even when life throws you a curveball, even when you feel discouraged, when you're down and out, Romans 8.28 says He causes everything. How many things? Everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes for them. God has a will and a purpose for your life. And even when it doesn't look like it, even when everything is horrible, everything is going wrong, are you going to believe Him then? Even when your prayers are hitting the ceiling, they're not hitting the ceiling. There's a sky roof and it's going right through. He hears you. He's answered you. You're His child. He loves you dearly. And He has a plan and a purpose for your life. So concluding this series, I got a question for you. I start each message with a question and I'm going to end this series with a question and that's this. Do you trust God even when His plan is different than yours? 
Do you trust Him even when it looks different? Even when it feels different? I mean, do you trust Him? When you're discouraged, are you still going to trust Him? When, you, when, you, when you're not sure what's going on, when everybody else deserts you, are you still going to trust Him? His plan is best. And just remember this, when, when I'm at my lowest, when I'm at my lowest, God is my hope. When I'm at my darkest time, God is my light. When I'm at my weakest, God is my strength. And at my saddest time, God is my comforter. He is everything you need. He is the only thing you need. We get ourselves in trouble when we start looking for answers in other places. God is more than enough. He's more than enough. Are you trusting Him? Are you seeking Him in prayer? He is the answer. And as we pray, we can discover His will for our life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Everybody's head is